Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Critical Reactions with your host, Brian. We're going to continue on with this week of math core, looking at these noisy, technical, convoluted uh, core tracks. <laughs> this stuff's really difficult to describe. If I heard it, I'd be like, oh, that's math core. But there's a lot of aspects to it, I think, that help, stand, that help it stand out from other similar genres. And I don't really know what those defining aspects are yet, which is kind of the point of the week, to explore the genre and hopefully get a better understanding of what it is, what it does. All right, so today we're going to dive into a huge favorite, uh, I should say a community favorite. Car, Car Bomb hasn't really grown on me yet, but they are a band that gets requested a lot, especially after the Dillinger Escape Plan uh, video for Monday. So let's dive into this. This song is called Dissect Yourself. I don't even know. I don't. Interesting. There's some wild tuplet ideas in that last section to make it sound like a uh, retardando. I'm looking anywhere for some understanding of what I just watched. Um, jeez. So, I do want to touch on this real quick. Uh, that that final moment there, right before the the breakdown, that super sludgy moment. Uh, right before that, though, we had. Uh, what I said they were using some tuplets to introduce a, a retardando effect. And what I mean by that, so so tuplets is when you put X amount of beats inside of a smaller amount of beats. So a triplet is three beats where we would normally have one. Um, well, it depends. Kind of depends there. Um... But yeah, so triplet is a grouping of three within a different 
uh, a different amount of uh, beats, right? Because if we do things uh, typically, uh, saying we're in 4-4, four, four, right? Quarter note gets the beat. So in two beats, we can do two quarter notes. If we divide those perfectly in half, instead of quarter notes, we have eighth notes. And in two beats, we have four of those. So if our quarter notes were bop, bop, our quarter note, or our eighth notes are bop, 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 bop. Perfectly symmetrical there. Um, but we can't really break that up into three very well. We don't have a notation for three. There's, we don't really have something between a quarter and an eighth note. We don't have a sixth note. That's not something that uh, we have in musical notation. So instead, we use the idea of a triplet. And we combine multiple notes uh, with uh, like a bracket that sits above them and a number within the bracket to tell you how many notes are going to be there. So if the quarter notes were two and the eighth notes were four, we're now going to put three notes within those two beats. And we notate that with the three that tells us there's going to be three in here. Um, but you can put any number there. You can put five. You can put two. <laughs> Uh, you know, you can utilize different lengths based on the notes that you choose. You could have triplet quarter notes, triplet eighth notes, triplet half notes, um, and that's going to um, tell the, the performer, the musician, how long, how much space this tuplet is going to be. And the number in the bracket tells you how many notes are going to be, or what this, uh, what it's going to be subdivided into, right? So when we do the quarter notes, we see that it's going to take up two beats, and we're going to subdivide it into three notes. Well, they used some odd tuplets. Might have actually even not have been tuplets. It could have just been uh, a varying degree of dotted notes. And what a dot means is if a quarter note gets the beat, like in 4-4, four, four, if you have a dotted quarter note, it's one and a half. So you're going to get the length worth of a quarter and then half of that, which would be the eighth, um, which is going to be one and a half beats. That's what the dot represents. And you get an extra half of length on, on the note that you're given. Um, and it creates these elements of feeling dragged out, right? And they utilize that in that section. It was just in the drums. I think it was really the snare that was uh, putting so much more weight on the strikes. Or I guess another way to put it is they were putting more and more space between the strikes. So it started out as like blast beats or something and they were slowly slowing down how fast they were hitting the snare. And it felt like we were doing this, uh, this retardando, which is just music terminology for slowing down. And I, I felt like the song was slowing down. We were going to, you know, finish out the song or maybe slow into nothing, which would be how the song ends. Maybe we fade out of that nothing. And so I'm feeling this, this retardando effect. And I'm like, okay, you know, we're starting to drag. We're going to move into something. But that's when it caught my eye that the symbols had not changed tempo. And that's when I figured we had some really interesting modulation going on with the implication of slowing down, which worked well because the next section was that super sludgy one. But it contrasted heavily with the fact that the metronome instrument, the cymbals at the time, were not slowing down at all. And I got to feel this very strange moment where my brain understood the tempo was not moving and the tempo was slowing simultaneously. Weird Schrodinger's tempo right here, where it was both slowing down and not moving at all simultaneously. Very strange feeling. <laughs> um, so yeah, I wanted to bring that up real quick, because I don't think it's really going to tie into any larger topics of discussion, but I, I did want to bring it up, because it was very cool. Very cool. And like I said, it does work as foreshadowing, because like... Two bars later, we've entered into the sludgy uh, final breakdown moment. So the idea of introducing a slower tempo, or at least the illusion of a slower tempo before actually bringing it in, is great foreshadowing. Gets the mind ready for it, especially when most of the other song, uh, yeah, most of the rest of the track is not 
uh, slowing down at all. There's not really a lot of slow moments in it, period. I mean, we went through like five or six sections in less than three minutes. This was just constant momentum, constant speed, bustling right through the track. So, yeah, uh, having a little bit of foreshadowing to a highly contrasting element of the song makes perfect sense. Um, so... I'm going to touch on time signature real quick, just because I feel like it's such an integral part. I don't feel like I can talk about a math core track without speaking about the meter. And this song was not as chaotic as what we had seen previously. Dillinger, Escape Plan, and Botch were all over the place with uh, their time signatures. Um, and a lot of them were not just uh, rapid changing, but also going to very odd time signatures. And this one seemed to be not as concentrated on that element. They did move around time signatures a bit, but it was in favor of the groove, not in a way to disrupt it. I don't feel like there were many aspects or many sections here that I couldn't bob my head along to even if I didn't understand what was going on. I think that that uh, innate groove was still able to be found in most of these sections. Some of that, I do think, is just going to be along the lines of utilizing 4-4 a lot more than the previous bands I, I've checked out this week. Uh, the core verse, I think it's a, I actually don't know if it's a verse or a chorus. <laughs> it was one of the repeated parts. Um... Anyways, we had three bars of four and then a bar of five to make the four bar phrase feel a bit extended to make it feel like it's overstaying its welcome and that we aren't moving to the next section like we should, that there's a bit of a hang up there. Uh, and aside from connecting that to the song title, Dissect Yourself, I'm not sure what they're really going for. Maybe when we look into the lyrics, um, I'll see possibly why the song would need to emphasize this element of longing or a lack of desire to move on or you know anything else that remaining in a place beyond when you should overstaying your welcome that kind of concept would be utilized uh, because that's what that typically I mean <laughs> the nice thing is you can attribute uh, musical ideas to a ton of uh, thematic uh, elements but that's usually why it's utilized because that's exactly what it feels like especially when you get it out of nowhere you have these three bars of four four you're feeling the groove you think you know what's going on this next bar comes up you get your four beats you're ready for the next bar to start you're in this groove and there's an extra note there where did it come from why did it disrupt your groove why is it emphasized? And then the one is emphasized. We get a snare on the five and the one, if I remember correctly. So it's the first time. Well, yeah, it's the only time. The first time, especially uh, when the section first comes around, you're not expecting it where you're not getting this uh, this nice groovy element. It's actually becoming a bit disruptive with uh, injections into the groove. So not only is it overstaying its welcome, but it's also injecting extra uh, accented notes which disrupts the grooviness of the track um, so yeah any of those elements of disruption or not being able to move on that's the kind of themes I'm going to be looking for in the lyrics later but I do think it lines up a little bit well with dissect yourself trying to figure out uh, you know who you are what your hang-ups are you know what your faults are that's kind of what I am getting from the song title and you know, it's not an easy thing to dissect oneself to, I mean, you're too close to the subject. You don't want to see your own faults kind of thing. Um, so, th you know, having those ideas already in my mind really helps, uh, you know, kind of picture what they might be going for there. And, you know, like I said, what I'll be looking for in the lyrics. Um, but then a few of the other sections, they don't really stray too far from that central 4-4 four, four idea. I do think they play a lot with uh, modulation, right? And we looked at this yesterday with Haken, I think it was. Not not math core, but Haken was also all over the place with time signatures. Um, a really appropriate special selection for the week, actually. But we saw 
sections of the track where the time signature was not represented in any of the rhythmic aspects of the music. And in, and, um, in fact, we were actually hearing different modulations on this. Uh, so, so some um, polymetric ideas being represented against that 4-4, four, four, but without the 4-4 four, four actually being present. And I think what we're being shown here is something very similar. I don't think there are any sections where the 4-4 four, four is not represented in something. There's usually, even there at the end when it started to get real, uh, the section before it got real sludgy, um, we were getting a lot of interesting accented notes in the snare. The guitars were all kind of all over the place. The vocals were just doing this constant uh, attack, so there wasn't any emphasized beats that we could feel from there. A lot of it felt a bit chaotic in free time, especially once we started introducing the tuplets or the dotted notes in the snare that gave it that retardando feel. But when you listen in to the cymbals, I think it might have been... I can't remember if it was the hi-hat being struck while it was open or if it was uh, stomping on the hi-hat pedal and opening and closing it. But either way, we were getting, I believe, a 2 and a 4 emphasized beat out of that. It was keeping this real rigid metronome feel against all this chaos. So, even though, uh, you know, there's a lot of chaotic elements here that contribute to a, an odd time signature feeling, there is still one instrument there that laid down the metronome. And it happened to be, at least to me, it felt like this idea of four. It could have been six, honestly. Uh, I was having difficulty finding the phrasing, but it was definitely something where the quarter notes were getting the beat and every other beat was being emphasized. So really, depending on phrasing, that's going to be the thing that kind of uh, changes the perception of whether it's 4-4 four, four or 6-4. Um, could probably even be 2-4. And also, depending on how many repetitions we go, it could be something like 3-4. Because if we do two repetitions of three, four, or four repetitions of three, four, we get 12, and 12 is even. It's something that feels natural. Uh, it has that symmetry to it. So it's, going, it's not going to feel as disjointed. And a lot of this section, that's kind of what I'm pointing at here, and what I'm trying to locate is that it doesn't feel disjointed. There aren't too many sections that feel like they're out of place or purposefully trying to trip me up. A lot of it does kind of fit into that 4-4 groove uh, that you can just kind of, you know, bob your head to or move your body to uh, and just kind of feel the music without it being overly technical. And I think a lot of that comes from the fact that they are using more standard uh, time signatures just with some wild modulation on top of it or some polymetric or polyrhythmic ideas on top of it. Um, so. In that regard, I, I do kind of enjoy this a little better than <laughs> Botch or Dillinger Escape Plan. It's just less chaotic in the time signature. It still brings the energy, right? It still brings that chaotic feeling, but it doesn't have that chaotic foundation. It's more of bringing the illusion of the chaos without the actual chaos and attempting to control it. And that's not to say that Dillinger Escape Plan or Botch are bad. If you go and listen to... Those, uh, those reactions, I had a lot of words to say about them, a lot positive as well, um, for what short, <laughs> what shorter songs they were. I had a lot of things to say. Um, they, they do what they do phenomenally well, and if that's what you're in the mood for, or if that's what you enjoy, I'm not going to tell you you're wrong for it, but my personal tastes, I like to have a little bit more continuity in my music a little bit more uh, cohesion between what's going on and uh yeah these guys bringing the illusion of something chaotic while still having something to groove with something that feels cohesive that's that's more up my alley so i really enjoy them doing that now instrumentation what is going on here we have guitars we have bass we have drums we have vocals uh there are a couple of clean vocals at the end but most of this is going to be harsh vocals and there's laser beams. <laughs> Why? I mean, it sounds cool, don't get me wrong. And I think it's even wilder that I'm not sure where they come from. And I think that's the cool part. 
And I kind of don't want that to be demystified, but I'm also really curious. Any other band, I'd say they have a synthesizer, they got, uh, you know, they have something in a DAW to give them uh, some sounds or whatever. It's digital. You know, the end result is that it's a digital sound um, created with software. Well, I guess technically that still might not be wrong, but the other idea that I have because of a couple of sounds they've made with their guitars is that those are guitars. And I'm not sure. I Part of me just wants to believe these guys are, are audio wizards and they made these space sounds and uh, the laser sounds with their guitars because the guitar is cut out on almost all of them. We don't get the that uh, that raw metal guitar timbre once these sound effects come in. It feels like one guitar is dropping out and this is coming in to replace it. And you know, guitars are one electronic we run we, we you know we make them digital we run them through effects pedals we run them through cabinets and and amplifiers and then in the end they go into the computer into the daw anyways so any effects that we were going to play with a keyboard uh you know a midi keyboard or whatever we could do just as well with the guitar we would just need to modify the sound coming in rather than creating a sound out of nothing. But also the idea of taking a guitar, taking a sound that we're familiar with and running it through enough pedals and effects to create these sounds that, at least to me, are very spot on with what I think of when I think of especially some old timey you know 70s 80s sci-fi sound effects uh it just kind of blows my mind it's that whole thing of uh you know talking about uh some of these uh, electronic artists like igloo ghost or or alan moore a lawnmower um and there's probably a bunch more i'm forgetting that i've heard on the channel but how they not only craft their music from a composition standpoint, but they also make all of the sounds that they're utilizing from scratch. Uh, and, you know, how that aspect of electronic music just really, I'm enamored by it, right? They are not only painting the picture, but they're creating the tools to which they're painting. The, they're making their paint, they're making their paintbrushes, they're making their canvas. Everything is theirs from the ground up. It is mind-blowing. And that element of creating the sounds that you're working with, if I'm correct, and this is the guitar, is that same element that I love about techno music here. And that just kind of blows my mind. Um, so yeah, like, it's wild. And like I said, any other band would be like, okay, you know, they're just, uh, you know, some, some, they, they made the sounds in, in a synthesizer program or, you know, they got some sample packs and this is just an old 70s style laser beam sound. And maybe they're putting like some heavy, um, whatever that sound effect is, where it feels like it's cutting in and out real quick, you know, get the sound, pop this effect on it, call it a day, but no, like I kind of feel like they put a lot more work into that and they're doing it with a guitar and that just blows my mind. Um, and I think the last thing I really want to touch on is the technical aspect of all of this and the way that they walked the line. I kind of already touched on this with the time signature, but I think it's also within the... Uh, the melodic work as well, if you could call it melodic work. A lot of this is more textural element, but they walk a fine line between being technical, having these really fast lines, uh, you know, merging the dissonant with the har uh, harmonic, the dissonant with the consonant, um, and just making palatable noise. I think that's going to be a way to say it. And I'm that's not to say that this is super palatable. If I found somebody on the streets who listened to 
you know, radio pop or hip hop or whatever and played them this, they're going to think this is just the most disgusting thing they've ever heard and not in the, the metal, dude, that's disgusting. Like, not like that. Just like, it's a mess, right? This is not going to be palatable for a general audience. But I, especially after listening to some of the stuff this week, am not a huge fan of mathcore. It has a very abrasive atmosphere to it that just, it kind of doesn't work for me. I appreciate the technical aspect of it, but on a casual side, it's just, it's missing. It's too technical. I think that might be, uh, I don't want to say words that I don't think are accurate. I was going to say it's missing soul, and I don't think these songs are missing soul, but they are more technical than I prefer in my music. And I think they do trade a little bit of something to achieve that technical aspect. Whereas in this one, it walks this fine line between the technical part, right? There are some technical lines in here, but it isn't allowing the technicality to get in the way of the listenability of the song, I suppose might be a way to, to word it. Um, but me, as someone who's not a big fan of the genre, at least what I've been introduced to it, enjoyed this for the most part. It kept my attention. And some of that also might be the runtime. Botch was like seven minutes. I don't remember. Uh, Dillinger was like five, I think, maybe. Uh, they were a bit on the longer side, which... Like, I think it was the Dillinger song that I mentioned felt like an eternity. But it was also ridiculously quick. Like, we've listened to some lengthy songs that feel like they've gone by in a moment, right? We've listened to some 20, 25-minute epics, and it feels like I was, you know, just started, you know, just hit the play button. We're already finished. And then the Dillinger song, half, three minutes in, I feel like I've been listening to it for an hour. Uh, and I think it's just this combination of having so many elements um, just constantly moving, whether it's uh, the constant guitar playing, constant drumming, the speed, the time signature changes, and then just having a ton of uh, smaller ideas being played back to back to back to back. Uh, you know, I even mentioned in the Dillinger, if we took the first minute and a half, I think, cut it down to halftime and pulled uh, a three minute song out of that, I, th I think it would have felt complete. And this is what I'm talking about. I think having a shorter song length works very well, at least for me, with these kind of tracks because they are incredibly dense and they pack a lot of stuff in a small amount of time. Um, so not only that, uh, the lengthwise, that's more palatable to me, but also, like I mentioned, they're, they're fantastic at sort of walking the line between technicality and musicality. I don't know if that's the word I want. Technicality and listenability. I think that's what I said earlier. I'm still not happy with that phrasing, but I think it's where I'm just where I'm going to have to go with. Uh, so yeah, let me dig into some lyrics here and see what's going on. And that's kind of what I expected. Um, it sort of does line up with this idea of uh, putting yourself under the microscope and examining who you are, your strengths, and your weaknesses. Uh, says especially at the end i think this is kind of where it well actually the the first stanza here says uh cut through the skin don't move let your thoughts infest your brain it's true pain is truth immersed in the now can't escape and this sort of you know brings about the idea of boredom it's not cool to be bored anymore right uh, you know, every moment of your time should either, one, be monetized. <laughs> if you have a free moment, you might as well be, you know, hustling, right? Go and get that that uh, that contract job with, with Uber and, you know, spend your, your free moments getting more money. You know, you got that hobby you like, put it on Twitch or, you know, make a YouTube channel. <laughs> uh, no moment of your time should be unmonetized. Uh, and then, of course, the other idea of that is no moment of your time should be wasted. There's always something to see. Usually, they're meaning about social media. Reddit, 
Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, there is something to swipe through and you can continue to swipe and keep your mind occupied so you never have to actually think. This idea of let your thoughts infest your brain, the pain is truth. There is this idea uh, coming about in recent times of self-medicating through uh, you know, positive social media or even negative social media, hate scrolling. Um, so we are kind of conditioned in a lot of ways in modern times to not give ourselves a moment to think. And if we are thinking and we have, you know, painful thoughts, we should ignore them. We should push them down. We should find some diversion. Go through social media, boot up Netflix. There's something for you to watch and ignore your pain. There's something you can watch or do to forget about thinking. This is a song that says, remember who you are. You know, dig back down inside. Meditate. You know, be one with yourself and figure out what you're thinking. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be comfortable, but it needs to be done. Um, and this sort of lines up uh, in the middle. It says, watch how you work, not in control, like the machine you are, working unconscious, blind observer. This idea of being on autopilot through our days. We wake up. We scroll through Facebook, we brush our teeth, we go to work, we come home from work, we scroll through Facebook, we cook some dinner, we watch Facebook <laughs> while we're eating, and we go to bed, usually with a phone in our hand, scrolling through Facebook. And of course, Facebook can be replaced with any other social media or new media vice that you will. Anything that allows you to self-medicate and ignore your thoughts and feelings. We spend a lot of time not having downtime. And this song says, uh, you know, it's time to return to where we were. Um, and I like that. I think it's a really good message. But it also brings about the ideas of discomfort and uh, not wanting to move on. Exactly what I was talking about with that random 5-4 being tossed in against the 4-4. Four -four. Uh, and... You know, it has to be done, right? I don't think that you can, I don't think it's impossible to make math core that is extremely groovy, that you can uh, have the complex time signatures in there, but still create something that a listener can groove along to, even if they don't understand the complexities in your metric modulation. But here, it feels very specific. Like I mentioned, a lot of this song has a strong groove to it, but here in this moment, I don't remember if this is the verse or the chorus. It does not allow the listener to be comfortable. It tosses in that extra beat every four bars. We have this four bar phrase with this hiccup at the end where it feels like we can't move on, where it disrupts our comfort. That's exactly what they're telling us we should be doing. Um, it's no different than listening to the guitar sounds. And jamming along with the guitars are doing. And then space noise or laser beams. And then we're back to the guitar. There's this constant disruption of enjoying the moment. That's, no. There's this constant disruption of being sucked into the media. I think that's the way. Uh, they want you to enjoy the moment. They want you to be more present in what you're doing. That's the message of the song. Um, and they're using these sounds and this time signatures to disrupt your engagement with the song and saying, hey, you know, remember, this is just music. Don't don't utilize this to self-medicate, you know, be more present. Don't allow this to just exist in the background kind of thing. Don't let yourself to exist in the background. And I love it. I think they do a fantastic job of marrying these ideas, um, even within, you know, car we've listened to some car bomb. This is kind of their style. But I love how they know what they are and they have at least this song, I don't know if this happens often, lines up with the kind of the themes that they are talking about in the lyrics line up with the music that they kind of traditionally create anyways. So just really cool. Uh, those are my thoughts though on Car Bomb's Dissect Yourself. This is where you guys come in. Hit me up in the comments. Let me know if you enjoyed this one or not. Let me know if you agree with me, if you think I'm spot on, if you think I'm way off, you know, go ahead and give me your perspective as well. Let me know what you're thinking about this one. Above the comment section is a description box and there's a link for Linktree. 
It'll take you to this menu right here, has everything related to the channel and more. You can follow me on Twitter, join the Patreon, uh, join the Discord community, pick up some merch, a bunch of stuff. Go ahead and check it out. It's a lot, a lot of things going on in there. <laughs> Above the, the description box, if you could, like, subscribe, and ring the bell. I greatly appreciate all three of those. We have one more video that came out five minutes ago. It is a special selection for a band called Windier. I believe they're folk black metal, if I remember correctly. Um, and it's it talks about a, a, a Norwegian king, I believe. I don't remember. I got a lot of context for it, but I haven't looked at it in a couple days. So I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to remember what I saw. Uh, but anyways, I'm pretty excited for it. I think it's an interesting topic to go about, especially combining the folk element into black metal uh, and talking about some historic figure. So that'll be fun. If that doesn't interest you, though, or if it does, you'll hear this again in that in the end of that video. I'll be back tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 10 p.m. UTC. We'll be looking at our penultimate math core band and our final special selection for the week. All right, until next time, remember to be critical but not cynical of the music you listen to and have a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening whenever you choose to watch my videos. Mm -hmm.